Um, so I'm Doug Montgomery from NIST. Um, amongst other things, I run the USGV6 program at NIST. Um, I'm also on, um, I guess, the executive committee of uh, the federal IPv6 effort in the US government. So I was gonna provide a bit of an overview um, of the government-wide initiative, um, what it is, what it means, and how we got there. Uh, and then maybe drop back and talk about some things that we do in the USGV6 program. Um, so as already hinted in the previous slide, and um, I guess it's reasonably well known that um, just a little bit over a year ago in November, um, the Office of Management and Budget in the US government uh, issued a, a new um, IPv6 initiative uh, memo um, titled Completing the Transition to IPv6. Um, this is actually the, the third uh, generation, if you will, of a government-wide IPv6 policy. And um, you know, the real highlight, the technical highlights here are that um, this memo is, is expressing the strategic intent for the federal government to deliver its information services, operate its networks, and access the services of others using only IPv6. Um, before this memo was issued, we spent a lot of time interacting with key players in the industry to make it clear that um, this is the direction that we wanted to go as a, as a strategic intent. Um, I must say, um, while, while industry reacted with, you know, um, uh, uh, some focused interest on exactly what the deadlines were, the actual strategic intent, um, we heard nothing but support for. So the memo outlines um, maybe three key milestones, which were uh, also mentioned in the previous uh, talk is to get 20% um, of government um, IT systems to IPv6 only by the end of our fiscal year 2023, 50% by 2024, and up to 80% by 2025. Um, in previous initiatives, government initiatives, um, there was a, a, a V6 initiatives, there was one in 2010, there was one in 25. You know, one of the things we realized is that you couldn't break legacy systems. There's lots of homegrown software and systems in the government, um, you know, for various uh, historical reasons, good and bad. And one of the things that was thought that you couldn't do was break legacy systems. Um, you know, the new memo, uh, uh, the new initiative um, basically says that, you know, when you identify a system that cannot be converted to IPv6, um, you should provide a schedule for how you're going to replace or retire those systems. So we're willing to break legacy systems now. By break, I mean force them to evolve to a more modern platform. Um, you know, I mentioned that um, you know we weren't just jumping off the, uh, the 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 deep end of the pool here without any background. Um, there have been initiatives in the U.S. government since 2005. Um, which started with very simple requirements for agencies to try to enable V6 over um, wide area networks, but set a few pieces in place. Um, one, NIST was tasked to produce a standards profile um, that could be used to support acquisition activities. There was actually, back in 2009, a federal acquisition regulation put in place that regardless of whether you know it, it was your or not, Starting in 2009, all networked IT and services um, were to be bought with IPv6 capabilities in them um, to support that as well. We stood up a product test program back then. Um, there was a, a memo in 2010, a new, a, a new revision to the initiative. The key thing there is it really set deployment um, milestones that mattered to get public facing services, um, V6 enabled by 2012, and to upgrade uh, enterprise networks um, by 2014. Lots of things, of course, in this continuum, you know, government policy is sort of changing, but, you know, the world is changing as well. Address shortage gets worse, products get better. And in, as I mentioned in November, um, the latest initiative, the latest version of the, the government V6 initiative comes out. Um, and it has these for deployment, getting all the way out of um, 
federal IT systems by 2025. When you look at that long timeline of having um, government initiatives in this space, you know a few things that that have become clear over time, right? Is that acquisition or common acquisition requirements across a large user base can drive the industry? Um, you know, our 2010 initiative, uh, I know for sure, and um, various large CDN providers and other um, uh, service and, and platform vendors. Um, you know, the, the vendors implemented V6 because the government was requiring it in purchases. Um, because we had this long standing program of tech refresh, right? You're buying, you're buying V6 capable devices, whether or not it was on your immediate horizon. Um, the idea of producing standards profiles and product testing um, programs to produce the right requirements for products. Um, to ensure that products that they're being uh, offered in, in purchase uh, acquisition actions um, actually support V6. I mean, there was a, a middle ground in there where lots of products claimed V6 support and did um, little or nothing. Um, so we stood up these test programs to protect um, the investments that we were requiring in these acquisition sort of long, long uh, term strategic acquisition programs. And the other thing that we learned in all of this is specific measurable, uh, specific milestones and measurable metrics, ones that you know are publicly visible, um, drives action. And you know the, the image on the right here is a is a graph from a deployment monitor that we run across the federal government. And you know this spike on public facing systems at the end of 2012 is exactly, of course, when that mandate said you had to get there. Um, so we're, we're sort of carrying these themes forward. Um, this is a, a very informed group. I won't uh, belabor too much about why, why we are trying to transition to V6 and V6 only. Um, but a, a few points I will touch on, right, is that um, you know, we're trying to remove barriers to innovation. And if IPv6 it, you know, ends up being nothing more than V4 with bigger addresses, um, that'll be a disappointment to what we're trying to achieve here, right? And so folks have mentioned the work that is going on in various you know, uh, uh, IoT environments with six low pans, stacks like the ones coming out of Matter, mm -hmm. functionality like you see out of segment routing uh, with V6. All of these things, right, are, are key innovations. And you know, the, the, the previous talk that talked about the struggles of getting um, uh, extension headers to the point that the industry is willing to adopt and deploy them are concerning, right? Because we want more here out of V6 than just V4 with bigger addresses. We want the technical innovation. Um, we do think it has a security uh, play, and and you know I'm not going to argue about you know protocol wise uh, you know security features or IPsec or anything like that, right? But from where we're going with other initiatives and in zero trust architectures um, for security, you know, the ability to uniquely identify a network address is a key part, right? To be to be able to identify devices for you know micro uh, micro segmentation down to being able to to provide network segmentation to individual processes or containers, and the ability to do. Um, behavioral analytics and factor that into security architectures, right? All of that is, you know, keyed off of uh, the ability to uniquely identify devices. And also we're seeing some interesting things in folks who look at a vast address space and innovate in, in network security technologies and do things that we could never have done in before, you know, provide client specific um, server addresses and responses to DNS so that you can track uses. Another overarching theme is reducing cost and complexity. Why now? I think we've touched on all of this. I will say that because we've had these two other initiatives, um, lots of agencies, my own included, have deployed V6 on their public facing services. Lots of government agencies see today um, over 50% of their traffic to public facing websites are coming in over V6. Um, a fewer number of agencies um, met the second milestone of the, the previous initiative fully. Um, you know, NIST did, we've been native to the desktop for years and years and years. 
Um, and one thing to note in this that, that I don't touch on explicitly is that um, at the 2010 my, uh, initiative of the government, at the time the US DOD was um, sort of equally committed to the vision and then backed off for some number of years, but the US Department of Defense um, has their own V6 initiative now that is um, moving forward and um, you know has similar goals to uh, the civilian government kinds of uh, initiatives. Why V6 only? Um, you know, we can get back to cost and complexity and reducing attack surfaces. Um, you know, the, the maturity of transition mechanisms is getting better. But, you know, we're not naive about this. Getting to V6 only networks is going to require work in um, some, if not many, areas. There are some interesting questions that are still out there. Um, you know, we think the intent of the government initiative in this space, the intent is clear to get to V6 only networks, but actually the technical details, whether you talk about from a product capability perspective or a network operation perspective of exactly what did we mean by V6 only, right? You know, and people have discussed all kinds of dimensions to that. V4 is not present in the product. It's administratively disabled. It's there, but not provisioned with addresses. The network takes active steps to block V4. Um, all of those things are, um, you know, ne need some additional refinement to, to actually meaningful, meaningfully talk through that. And the other issue is how will we measure progress against the milestones, right? I said previously the fact that we could measure some of those milestones easily, um, especially on public facing services, was a real catalyst to getting folks moving. And, um, you know, we're still discussing how to meaningfully measure these milestones um, in the current initiative. It was mentioned before um, about cloud services, and um, there's a lot of discussion in the US government circles about what does V6 only mean in cloud or shared services. Um, as the previous talk noted, um, many, many non-standard, non-traditional you know, V6 over a, a commodity operating system on a real network. Um, you know, there's lots of differences in the way that uh, cloud networking services work. And because we um, try to provide a product testing program um, um, and do provide a product testing program for, you know, your traditional commodity products, how to test V6 capabilities in the cloud is something we're still struggling with. And if you're a federal CIO and you see, you know, the the, the drive to V6 only, um, you're also confronted with the fact that there are other um, government IT policies that you're trying to deal with. Um, there's a strong initiative for zero trust networks. Um, we have something known as the Trusted Internet Connections Program, um, CDM programs. All of these other initiatives that require various capabilities or configurations of networking, we have to make. Um, integrate and, and consistent with the drive to V6 only networks. Um, status of the initiative is that all agencies in the government have marching orders um, to organize around um, these goals and um, are doing so. Um, we have a fairly active user community. We have monthly um, V6 task force meetings. Um, agencies were required to identify and execute IPv6 only pilots um, in, in the very short term within uh, our fiscal year 2022 and um, <clears throat> publish, uh, develop and publish implementation plans um, for how their agency in particular are gonna follow through with uh, the requirements of the, of the program. So one of the things that um, I wanted to touch on a bit, and it sort of follows nicely uh, Tim's presentation about the right profiling effort and is one of the things that NIST was tasked to do um, in the entire V6 program is um, the USG V6 profile and test program. I mentioned that we've had this long-term tech refresh based um, procurement requirement an actual acquisition requirement in the government um, to buy IT capable products. The obvious question there is <clears throat> how do you define IPv6 capable? 
and how do you to protect the investments when you might be buying these products even before you're, you're um, trying to deploy them. And so um, we established the, the, the USG V6 profile and test program to, to sort of respond to these last two bullets. Um, it's highly leveraged off of the V6 Ready logo program. So Tim had sort of already touched, touched on bits of that in talking about the, the right profile. Um, but you know, we're, we're aiming to provide conformance, interoperability, and functional tests um, in support of acquisitions, right? RFPs and acquisition. Uh, functions so that we can protect government users um, in buying equipment. So there are a couple pieces to the, the USGV6 program. One is a profile which might operate at a, um, um, in some ways, a level of detail that might be uh, greater than some profiles. Um, we've defined the standards profile that um, defines a vocabulary for expressing IPv6 requirements of specific products. It's not meant to be, um, in general, a, a very broad general sort of host requirements or least um, capability definition. It's actually meant to provide a vocabulary that people can write very specific um, IPv6 procurement requirements. Um, we do that by defining what we call capabilities, which is to um, you know take what are logically consistent bundled sets of IPv6 functionality, group them together in the RFCs and assign them a name like the core capability or Slack, some of the names you, know, you can see and will make obvious sense. And then we provide this notation um, called capability summary strings where you can um, use a string notation to define um, very specific requirements uh, for IPv6 capabilities in the product. Um, about the same time as the last initiative was announced, um, we produced a new version of the profile um, that that um, uh, revised and enhanced it in various ways to improve the usability, update RFCs, and all of that sort of thing. Um, but one of the things it also did is split the U.S. government profile into two documents. One is a, a generic NIST IPv6 profile. Um, which says nothing U.S. government specific, but it defines these um, capability, uh, these uh, V6 capabilities and the capability string notation. Uh, we did that because um, we too have had people pick up our profile and um, use it in other government contexts or other user group contexts. Um, and some people expressed that they would do that even more if the document didn't have all of this government mumbo jumbo in it. And so we separated the two. There's a, an SV6 profile, which is um, generic and does not mention anything about the US government. And the US government profile, which is just a thin delta on top of the NIST profile, basically telling you how you use the NIST profile in government procurements. So we have the system that we can produce a string notation for a very specific set of requirements. Of course, the question is always whether the product supports the requirements. Um, but before we get to that, inside the, inside the profile for every one of those name capabilities, you'll see in an expansion, um, you know, here the, we um, illustrate the core capability, the set of RFCs it maps to um, sometimes um, whole RFCs, sometimes specific subsections of RFCs. Um, in some cases, we um, you know, change the base conformance requirements of the RFC, maybe mandate uh, functionality that you know, was left optional in the host requirements document as an example. Um, the test program is um, government defined and managed, but really operated by an independent test laboratories. Years ago, we surveyed all the test programs that we could find and um, decided that we couldn't adopt any of them entirely, but we created one ourselves that we um, negotiated an MOU with the IPv6 forum to basically align our test programs with the IPv6 Ready Logo program as much as possible, um, basically, Anytime there isn't a technical difference in our requirements in their tests, it is effectively their tests. So we have accredited laboratories that use standard test methods for conformance and interoperability. Um, they test against our profile, but leveraging the, the V6 Ready logo tests. 
um, we have a test um, report template called the supplier's declaration of conformity. But the real thing to know is at the end of all of that, what comes out the other side is a um, capability string in the same exact vocabulary of the tested or claimed capabilities that the product supports. Um, like I said, we released a new version of all of this in uh, last November, um, simplified the profile, simplified the reporting, um, provided more examples for folks um, in how to write requirement statements, um, put some uh, questions on, on the CES doc that are um, uh, questions that everybody wanted to see answered about vendor products. Um, so you can go to our website and see revision one of this. There's a, a long series of documents that define the NIST profile, the USGV6 profile, and the requirements of the test program. Um, and you know this is up and running. The, the new profile is published and in place. Um, the tests are almost all filled in for the new profile, and products are being tested against it. Um, the the test program, as I said, is 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 slowly putting uh, the 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 um, revised tests in place. And this also, as Tim mentioned, it it aligns to changes that uh, uh, the V six ready logo pr program was making itself, moving to eighty two hundred and based RFCs and the such. Um, you know, we do have uh, a draft test plan out there for how to test IPv six only. And one of the things the profile does is define what it means for a product to be IPv6 capable of operating on an IPv6 only network, which really function focuses on sort of the life cycle functions of a product, your ability to, to um, uh, deploy, install, configure, manage, update the product um, on a v6 only network. I will say the first draft of that test plan, um, industry uh, reacted with uh, some concern because basically there's a lot of products we can't get there right now, right? Is uh, um, the first draft of that test plan said that all, you know, configuration management update functions must operate on the V6 only network. Um, <clears throat> that got a lot of in industry pushback. And so for, th for the first version of that test spec, we are now uh, stepping back to saying that you must have at least one um, means of configuration, installation, update, and management that operates on a V6 only network. Uh, there's uh, UNHIOL is an accredited test lab. There's a third party accreditation um, uh, body who um, yearly uh, updates their accreditation to test against this program. You can go to uh, the website that's listed here and look at the products that are being tested already against the new version of the RFC. Um, I won't belabor the uh, SDOC, the test results. You can look at that. There's certain key questions that it asks. Um, there's some attestations that aren't tested, but we ask the vendor to attest to them on, on a document that is uh, signed by a uh, company uh, officer and provided as part of a procurement response. Um, and like I said before, um, you know, the results, the, the summarized results of a test plan is one of these capability strings again. Let's see the details. The next steps for the program, um, we have a few more test plans to put in place, uh, finalize the IPv6 only test plan um, and begin to require vendors to test for it. Uh, I noted that we aren't really well positioned to test cloud services, so work needs to be done there. Um, NIST will probably produce a usage guidance document to help folks better leverage and use um, these tools going forward. And there's been some long-standing uh, efforts to merge uh, the US government and the USD, uh, DOD um, profiling and test efforts, and those are continuing. Um, yeah. Oh, one last thing. Um, Going all the way back to the first initiative, NIST produced some security guidance um, documents that are a little long in the tooth now. Um, they were published in 2009. Um, so we're working on an update 
uh, to those security guidance documents. When we published this stuff in 2009, um, we, we were kind of filling a vacuum. Now, of course, there's uh, much greater bodies of knowledge of IPv6 security issues, um, books, there's RFCs, there's best practices. Um, so um, the new version of this guidance document is going to be much more of a playbook to help federal CIOs understand what questions to ask themselves, what questions to ask vendors, and pointing to other existing uh, guidance that already exists in this area. And the other thing that I'll note is we're about to announce, uh, literally, I think this week, um, an NCCOE National Cybersecurity Center of Excellence demonstration project um, focused on evolution of um, enterprises to IPv6 only environments. I think that's it. Ah, some contact information. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Doug. There are some questions, a couple from Ed, I see. One around um, how you evaluate the quality of the implementation plans that are submitted. Um, how are those checked? Are they, can you just submit any nonsense and just tick the box, or is there some quality control on that? Um, that's interesting. Uh, um, primarily the responsibility of um, OMB and others, but um, I, I would say it's a, it's a, it's a work in progress. Um, there are some efforts of forming the teams that will review the implementation plans, but I don't think, um, I, 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 you know, there isn't, there, there isn't like a hard and fast template there of uh, worked out yet. So it's an issue. We're working on it, I guess, is a short answer. 